When Sony finally unveiled the PlayStation 5 console design during that future gaming livestream, they also showcased a range of new accessories that will be available on day one, like a new remote, a charging stand, an HD camera, but also a 3D wireless headset. And now that we have the console and these accessories, it's time to unbox them, review them, and find out, are they worth it? Let's start with the DualSense charging station. In the box, you'll find your standard documentation, the power brick, your typical figure eight power cable that we've seen plenty of times for PlayStation products, and finally the charging stand itself. Right off the bat, the build quality is solid, and this is quite honestly the nicest charging stand I've ever seen. And I pretty much always buy some sort of docking or charging station for my controllers. I always use them every generation, and this is by far the nicest one. The power cable will plug in underneath and towards the back, giving you an easy opportunity to place this in a more discreet manner that hides the running wire, which is what you'll probably want to do for your setup. It looks best that way when you can not only find a convenient location, but an aesthetically pleasing one too if you care about that sort of thing. I'm really liking my placement, propping it right between my PS5 and PS3. I sit rather close to my TV, so it's not a huge pain to reach over and grab a DualSense. Now, as I just mentioned, I always love using these things. They're extremely convenient, and they eliminate the need to use wired charging, which can lock up a USB port on your console, which arguably for PS5 is a bigger deal than what we normally see. It depends on how engaged of a consumer you are, but for PS5, you might want to use any of your USB ports for an external drive, a headset dongle, the PS4 camera, the HD camera, PSVR's breakout box. We're well past the console's three USB-A ports, so I think it makes more sense here to maybe go for one of these. Now, the actual act of placing the controller down and charging is great. The point of connection is on the bottom, and the mechanism moves when weight is applied. It's not some sort of clicking mechanism, which for example, the officially licensed DualShock 4 charging station does that. You have to click in a controller for charging to start, and the spring inside used for clicking the controller in can fail like how one of mine did. So with this, it's really a matter of just putting a DualSense in and letting charging start. It's not difficult at all to hit that sweet spot for the connection to be good. You might miss or have to adjust it, but it's still very painless most of the time. The charging speed you're going to get will match the USB connection directly to the console, which is about 3 hours. To me it seemed to charge faster than that, but I also didn't run a controller down completely dry, just down to low battery warnings. And charging a battery from nearly empty will always give you a lot of juice on the initial ramp up, and then charging starts to taper off once the battery becomes full. Either way, this is for two controllers, and the DualSense itself has a larger battery, so chances are you won't find yourself in a scenario with two dead controllers at any point. In conclusion, this is easily the best charging dock I've seen offered in the gaming space in a very long time, and I've used a lot of them. Now, having said that, I will always be the first to say this, these are so unnecessary if you're short on cash, you're paying a lot for what is really just solving a minor inconvenience, and at $30 USD, you get what you pay for. It's the best charging dock, but there's plenty of third-party offerings that come in a lot cheaper. But even without testing them, you can see they have different solutions for docking, and the charging rate is also probably slower. So, it's always hard for me to recommend these, but if you are going to get a charging stand, this is the one to get. Next up, the media remote. In the box, you'll find the remote, some instructions, and two Sony branded AA batteries. The setup process is very easy, almost too easy. Head to settings, accessories, media remote, and here you'll press the PlayStation button and options at the same time on the remote, and it will pair right away. It'll even run a quick test to see if the remote is also controlling your TV's volume. After that, you're good to go. If the remote does pair to your TV, you'll be able to control the volume or turn the TV on and off. That's it. If you have any sort of connected soundbar or sound system, that should also be controlled assuming your TV is properly connected to those systems too. On the remote itself, it's very minimal by design and function. You can use this to navigate the PS5's menu, fast forward, pause, resume, the usual stuff. On the bottom, you can see dedicated service buttons for Disney+, Netflix, YouTube, and Spotify. These are all either useful or useless to you depending on what you actually use out of those services, which if there is something, the quick launching from the button is super convenient. It's worth pointing out these services do differ depending on your country, so there might be different buttons down there. You'll notice at the top there's a microphone button and that's currently disabled. A future firmware update will come in and add functionality to this, so for now we can't comment on it, but hopefully it adds some interesting features to improve navigation and content search on PS5. The rest of the buttons sit ever so slightly above the main surface and give back a nice clicky responsive feel. For those that can't tell from the video, all buttons are plastic, there's no rubber or anything like that. So right now I have two main problems with this thing. First, getting the back cover off is a pain. There's a black recessed button you have to push down, and unless you've got longer fingernails, it's finicky to press. Second, the PS button being at the very bottom is awkward to hit. I would have preferred this closer to the center or up top. 
Also might not be a big issue, but on a flat smooth surface, the remote can spin freely, which might mean you'll find this thing on the floor more often than not. But essentially that's everything. This is also an accessory I like using on consoles, so I've had plenty of these over the years as well. And this remote doesn't exactly do the job any better or worse than the other ones I've had. If anything, this one seems to have more minor annoyances versus those other ones. So far, I've noticed that I often miss pressing any of the directional buttons in the center. They're a bit thin, and there's a lot of open space around them, so that's been a small complaint, if that. But really, this is just an okay device. And this is something where you either use these or you don't. There's not really much in between, so you'll know right away if this would even be worth a purchase to you, despite any shortcomings that it may have. Moving on to the most popular accessory, the Pulse 3D wireless headset. It's always a good opportunity to point this out, but as a reminder, you don't need to buy these for 3D audio, most headphones will allow that feature. These are basically just a PS5 branded premium headset you can buy with your console. Now the unboxing starts with some documentation, a USB-C cable for charging, a 3.5mm male to male headphone jack cable, the USB dongle, and the headset itself. On the left can only you'll find your mix for chat and game audio, the monitor switch, volume rocker, the mute button, charging port, headphone jack, and power switch. The actual headset seems to have an okay build quality with a decent amount of elasticity to fit most heads. There's a rubber cushion up top that stretches back and adjusts to fit most sizes, and wearing the headset for me is a comfortable experience, though I don't really have a large head to begin with, so I'm an average height, average build, just to give you an idea that I'm not particularly a large person, so on a long session of playing games, these fit well and don't feel uncomfortable to me. Now before actually playing games, make sure you head over to settings, sound, audio output, and enable 3D audio and make sure you pick a 3D audio profile. Picking one that sounds best to you is vital to achieving the sensation of presence while playing a game with 3D audio. And speaking of which, why don't we just get right into that. 3D audio is a big part of PlayStation 5, and at launch there's a decent amount of games that take use of this feature. Obviously, I think it's far too early to give this a final assessment, but playing a handful of the launch games has been an interesting experience. The 3D audio effect, for me at least, is more subtle than immediately obvious. At times, I found myself trying to hear it, trying to catch sounds around me, and those were the times where it was at its worst. But when I let go of trying to find it, I'd hear something behind me or to the side of me, Worlds really did start to feel more alive with simple ambient noises in the game having a real location value relative to where I was or where the camera was pointing towards. It was really cool when 3D audio did exactly what it was supposed to do. What's problematic about 3D audio is that some people may just be an edge case where they interpret sound in such a way that even the audio profiles won't help them. And that's why Sony wants to improve the feature over time with more fine tuning, more profiles, and more device support. Down the road, we'll see it mature into something that hopefully is more rich and exciting. For now, and more specifically back to Sony's headset, the sound quality on its own sounds great. This is where I will openly caution I'm not much of an audiophile, I can tell when something sounds great, just okay, or really bad, and these to me sound great. As an easy comparison for those curious, if you've owned Sony's official headsets before, this will definitely sound a step above those, whether you're using 3D audio on PS5, or playing PS4, or just listening to music from your phone, whatever you throw at it, the sound quality is deep, impactful, and full. Having said that, a step above is just that, a step above. I wouldn't exactly say these are miles better than other headphones in this price range. In fact, if you've got something right now that's a bit more modern, maybe purchased in the last two years or so from a reputable manufacturer, jumping into these might be a tough sell, especially when we consider the ability to use 3D audio on those headphones that you have right now. As for the mic quality, you can hear it right now. I'm in a party chat and it's a direct capture off of PS5 over wireless. It's got one noise canceling mic closer to where your mouth would be, and then another towards the back of the can. You can judge for yourself here, but I'd say using these for party chat or online play, you're gonna be ahead of what most others are using. Your voice comes in pretty clear, and the noise canceling does a reasonable job. I live near a road with a lot of heavier traffic that easily comes into a lot of my audio while I'm working on videos, but here it removes most of that. It's not perfect, but then again for the price range, this does a better job than most other headsets. As for battery life, Sony says 12 hours and it seems like it gets that. My tracking had it around 11 hours, give or take a margin of error, so it does seem close. Mileage will vary. Overall, the Pulse 3D wireless headset is an easy decision based around what you have right now. If you're ready to jump into a new headset for your new PlayStation 5, then these are a great fit, especially with the same white and black design characteristics pairing nicely with the PS5's console design. If you've already got a premium headset on hand from an established manufacturer, then the story is different. You'll know better than I do if it makes sense to even consider buying these based on what you have right now. 
Finally, we have the HD camera, an accessory that by and large will be the least popular here as it's rather limited in what you can actually do with it. In the box, you'll find your paperwork and the camera itself, and that's it. Pretty straightforward. You can see it's got a single hinge. This is where you can pan and adjust depending on how you place it. And it's got a lip that protrudes underneath the two camera lenses. This is where you'd prop it on the edge of your TV if it's going up top. And then it's just a matter of plugging it in and using it. There's not much setup outside of a camera calibration mode and settings. So what you'd use this for is recording yourself for gameplay capture or live streams. That's its sole purpose. We unfortunately learned you cannot use this for the current PlayStation VR headset, which would have been nice for improved tracking. So the only reason you would even consider this is for dedicated recording and live stream software built into PS5, which for that PS5 offers a surprisingly robust tool set. Share Factory Studio is the new gameplay editor on PS5 and there's actually a lot you can do with this. I was impressed. You can import all the direct captures from PS5 or outside clips from USB. There's transitions, overlays, layers, and for the HD camera, being able to record yourself to narrate your gameplay. I made some interesting choices when messing around with this, but that's part of the fun. And there's a lot more to it than just the standard Share Factory app on PS4, but we don't really have time to cover all that here. For broadcasting, PS5 also makes this extremely easy. You just link your Twitch or YouTube, press the Create button, adjust some key settings, and then you're live. It's the accessibility on PS5 that makes this so much more straightforward, and having HD camera helps add your face cam, which you can easily move and adjust around the screen, or make system level changes to how it actually appears. The camera itself records in 1080p, which for perspective the PS4 camera was essentially 800p, so the new one is a slight bump in visual clarity. Of course the big problem here is if you're even remotely interested in streaming or filming gameplay, you're probably doing this from a PC where you have limitless control over the presentation. So this really is more of a casual option, but I will say, this is easily the best casual streaming and recording option out there. Because with Share Factory Studio, you can easily create high quality 4K videos with better editing than most of what you'll find on YouTube today. Same goes for streaming, you'll be better off than most with this very easy setup. If you've always wanted to dip your toes into content creation in the gaming space, but don't have a ton of cash, the HD camera would be an excellent way of testing the waters. Of course, this would apply to a small group, and that's why for the most part the HD camera does find itself in an odd position. It's either gameplay capture, or nothing. And I'm gonna take a shot in the dark and say for most people, it's nothing. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have not yet, please subscribe for the best PlayStation news, reviews, and updates that are here on YouTube. We have more PS5 coverage coming. Uh, at this point, you can go to the channel and check out the PlayStation 5 playlist that we have. The last four or five topics covers the console's launch up to this point. And again, we have more topics to come. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at Mystic Ryan. And that is it. I will see you all in my next video. You take it easy.